What is up, everybody? Happy holidays. It's that time of the year of an unprecedented year. Um, this is uh, Music Business 101 q and I think this is our, uh, I think this might be our fifth or sixth. I think it's our fifth. I think this is our fifth episode of Music Business 101, a live Q&A. Uh, my name is Sean Healy. I've got Nelson Grigsby here. Um, we are promoters, and we've been promoters this coming year. 2021 will be our 25th anniversary uh, as a concert promoter. So obviously, this being the most challenging of years, we're going to talk about what's ahead of us in 2021 with shows and venues and touring because everyone wants to know about it. And the reality is no one has the real answer, but we're going to talk to Topher Christensen, who's been a friend of mine for, I think I've, I've known Topher for maybe a dozen years. Um, and Topher used to book BB Kings in Times Square. So if some of you remember BB Kings in Times Square, that was a very famous venue. Um, and he also booked uh, the Blue Note Jazz spot in, in Manhattan, and he booked at Highline Ballroom as well. So, uh, you know, we, we have a long history, um, and he's in the Midwest, but he's primarily an East Coast uh, promoter. And you guys know us, we're a West Coast promoter, um, although we do stuff on the East Coast, but we're primarily known uh, for being West Coast promoters, especially L.A., um, and really, you know, someone mentioned this to me the other day and, and without tooting our own horn, um, we were really able to bring hip hop to the Sunset Strip, um, in the, in the, say 2003 to 2013, um, they weren't allowing hip hop on the Sunset Strip at the Key Club or the House of Blues, um, very, very particular acts at the house of blues like obviously everyone's seen the tupac video there and all that but but it was really hard to do hip-hop uh on the sunset strip circa 2003 to 2013 i mean we used to book like rizza and ghostface and and the club owners would freak out on wu-tang the name and they'd make us hire a cop car uh we used to have to buy a sheriff's car for like 800 dollars a night and it was wu-tang you know so anyway um, but yeah, so we have a storied history, as some of you know, and Topher does too. And we do co-pros, uh, with Topher, um, several times a year. So he's going to give us his take on what's been going on for this past year, what's to come, um, and, and how we can all make sense of this because everybody wants the same thing. Everyone wants to know when, right? And it's going to be different my opinion is it's going to be different for different parts of the country. Okay. Some parts are already open like Dallas. I believe I saw Meek Mill at a pack club the other night or whatever. So, um, you know, some of the people, uh, you know, are already going to shows, but you know, it looks very unsafe to me if you ask my opinion. So, uh, what it's going to be like, what, what part of the country is going to be open for full capacity shows, what, what parts of the country are still going to be closed? L.A., we're in Los Angeles right now on my patio. And as you guys have heard, Los Angeles is, is just exploding with uh, corona. And everything's closed here, but it's still exploding. So, you know, it's very, very weird. So we're going to talk to Topher about all that stuff, about, you know, when we can get back to normal. Is he buying shows? Are we buying shows? Um, and I will tell you this. And some of you guys have tuned into these before. So our job for tonight, for the next hour, is just to give you free, free, free professional advice. Um, that's all I can say. I mean, we'll answer all your questions. Put them in the comments. Nelson's handling the questions, and we got a bunch of questions here. But the idea is here is to give back. Um, you know, obviously, we're not doing shows. No one's really doing shows. So... Um, I just want to help people. I know Topher wants to help people and all the guests that have been on here on Music Business 101. Same thing. Everyone's just down to give free advice, okay? Because for some people, it's really hard right now, especially artists, especially unsigned artists, you know, that 
that this was going to be their year to tour and to put music out, and, and it's really, really hard. So our Christmas present to you guys is free advice, so please ask questions down below, and we'll get into it. Um, i got a few notes I'm going to go through, and then we'll bring Topher in, and then we'll do Q&A for the whole time. Um, on our end with SHP, um, we get calls every day, okay? Every day, either in our DMs or at our office, hey, I uh, heard you book shows, I just want to get down with you, um, you know, what do I have to do? Well, it's simple, okay? First of all, there's no shows, so I can't help you, there's nothing to book. Um, but with that said, we put out newsletters uh, twice a week, okay? And that the, the, the newsletter that goes out on Mondays, that's the one that has all the available gigs that we're booking where we're looking for openers and supports, okay? So we still send that out. Now, we don't have live shows. We don't have a concert that you can get on right now. But we do have live streams, and we are doing them this weekend. We're doing one tomorrow night at El Cid in Silver Lake uh, with Little Debbie. And Sunday we're doing On the Outside at the Troubadour. We're renting out the Troubadour. We're bringing in a camera crew. We're going live. We're selling merch. So even the live stream bookings are available to you guys but here's what you got to do you got to go to the link in our bio and give us your email so put your email in the newsletter portion of the link in our bio and then on mondays you'll get the available gigs newsletter and then fridays you'll get the national concert letter and hopefully as we get into 2021 and shows start coming back and more opportunities those will all be listed in our monday news blast so Please, that's the best way to get down with us. That's the best way to get information. Everything's on webookbands.com or hit the link in the bio and give us your email for the newsletter so you're in touch with, with everything that we're doing um, and whatnot. So uh, with that said, um, we're going we're gonna to continue to do live streams until concerts come back. So I know on our end, every day we're talking to agents. Every day, okay? We're talking to agents, we're talking to managers, we're talking to artists, because I say this on every episode, but for right now, it really is live stream. That's just what it is. Now, you may not like live stream, you might think it's funky or wonky, and you don't want to perform on stage in front of nobody, and I get it. But remember, remember if you guys are artists out there, you have fans, okay? You have fans that have not seen you perform, it will be well over a year. So you owe it to your fans to give them something. So if you can't do it in person, really, really, really consider doing a live stream, okay? And there's a lot of ways to do it. You can do it a cheap way, okay? And do Instagram Live and grab your guitar or, or play some beats. Totally fine, totally acceptable. But if you wanna go on a grander scheme and there's opportunities to to open up for people that are doing live streams or to put together a live stream package yourself. You know, you can do that as well. You can get a couple acts, a couple local acts, you guys spaced out in the, in the backyard or garage and put it up there because remember, the fans want to see you. You may not like it, but the fans, you owe it to your fans. So consider live streams, okay? Um, one other note, we are... Uh, Still doing consultations. You can do a consultation with me if you want. Um, we're still doing marketing packages so we can promote your album, we can promote your show, we can promote your merchandise. Um, we're still offering all that stuff and you can get all the info about that in the link in the bio too for our, our goods and services. Um, next month, the next one, okay, it's gonna be January 29th. Uh, we're going back to the last Friday of every month. Is gonna be with Ty Cannon. Um, Ty Cannon, been a friend of mine for uh, probably 15 years. Um, he is Dr. Dre's direct A&R aftermath, okay? He handles Anderson Pock and, uh, and, and others, and Dr. Dre. So you want to talk to, you have questions for Dr. Gr Dr. Dre's A&R, January 29th, Q&A, Music Business 101. We'll be talking everything about labels label signings 2021 how the hell to get signed okay so again newsletter you'll get an email reminder about january 29th with ty cannon from aftermath february 26th is going to be atron gregory 
Atron was Digital Underground's manager and later became Tupac's manager. So we're going to talk to Atron about then and now, uh, managing then, managing now, and all that stuff. So again, you want to find out about these because I know people are looking on their phones or they're driving or whatever. Uh, the newsletter link in bio. Okay, let's bring in Topher Christensen, um, who has a company called T Presents. And Topher has a storied history. He was uh, at Live Nation. He was at Blue Note. Um, he's done his own thing, and he's really a unique individual. So uh, we're going to bring him in right now. Let me get this going. We're just waiting for him. Um, so I just invited him, Nelson, on there. Okay. So it says waiting for T presents. Um, so yeah, so if you have questions for for me or for T presents decline, <laughs> he, he <laughs> he's been trying to jump in the whole time, and oh, I've okay. been, I haven't let him. So let's have him do it again. Okay. Um, and if you like our merch, we have a store. It's called shpmarket.com, and we just dropped this snapback today. Uh, navy blue and California gold. It's embroidered. It's dope. It's an auto snap. It's really, really cool. So shpmarket.com. You can get all our SHP gear. Here he is. And uh, also, if you buy any of our gear, it helps us pay for our furloughed employees' health insurance. So if you enjoy these and you want to give back, you could buy a shirt, and that helps us. So shpmarket.com. That's in the link in the bio, too. Waiting for him to jump in again, Nelson. He sent the request. I accepted it, and it says waiting for him. Here we go. Here's Topher. Hey, there you are. Hey, Topher, man. What's up, buddy? How's it going? Good. Good. Uh, you are in Wisconsin? Yes. It How is cold. cold and miserable <laughs> is it? Well, I enjoy the cold, man. It's, I think it's about 25 degrees right now. I had my first wow. day of ice skating. So we are, get... um, we're, Nelson and I are on my patio. We're obviously in Los Angeles and we're up, we're up in the hills, but it's even cold here. Like we got a heater going on and yeah. nothing like what you guys are going through. No, but, no. But yeah, it's chilly. And, uh, you know, for LA, it, once it gets below 60, it's like burr. You know? Right. Yeah. Now we've got family in Florida who have winter coats on today and they're just like, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw New York Times Square last night. It was crazy. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's good to see you. Um, and hopefully you've been healthy this entire time with all this craziness. Um, it's been unimaginable for so many people um, in so many walks of life. And in our industry, evaporated. Yeah. And it just, on March 13th, the concert business evaporated. Yep. Just yep. went poof. Yeah, no it was more. crazy. It was crazy, man. I had a show, I think it was the 11th here in Wisconsin or 12th or something, you know, like an Irish show because, you know, St. Patrick's and whatever did pretty well. And we knew like that was it. Like the next day, no one was doing shows again. And it was just surreal, man, to be in the theater and not understand what was going on and back then there were no masks there's no distancing no one knew what was going on and, you know just a jam theater seeing a show and then all of a sudden it was gone <laughs> you know yeah i mean game we, over we had that you know it's like d-day i think it was march 12th or 13th and all the agents started calling us saying hey you gotta we gotta move the show we gotta move the show the tour is coming down like it was crazy and i had sort of told everyone in my office a week or so before I said, you know what, if one club decides not to open because of this, it's going to be a real issue around the country. Yeah. Can, totally. can you imagine like all the other venues in your city are open, but one decided to not open and then the other ones were going to follow suit. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been crazy, but I, I want to um, just kind of go over your background for everyone. Sure. Yep. And again, like if, if you guys miss a portion of this or whatever, um, we ha we keep it on our Spotify and our YouTube and uh, the links in the bio for all that. So you can watch these because we've been doing it for almost six months now, once a month. 
and appreciate you coming on. So yeah, definitely. So you you went to American University and got and then went to NYU for your graduate. Yeah, so I went to American University for my undergraduate. Um, I'm from Wisconsin. That's why I live here now. I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. So I wanted to get out of town. I hung out at the university in high school and growing up. I wanted to you know, see something different. So I went down to D.C. I was going to, you know, study international relations and who knows, do politics or government. But, you know, I'd been in a high school band and I really liked music. And so I went down to D.C. and I kind of, you know, I got to know some local musicians down there and kind of get in with some of the local music scene and ended up after my first semester of college abandoning you know international relations and politics and just kind of dove into music and music tech and business and things like that and kind of in in with some local bands there and was like oh I think I could probably make a career out of this you know that never kind of dawned on me until I left home and went to school that maybe you can actually make a living doing music um, so I designed my own major and undergraduate in business and, you know, recording and things like that. And after four years, I was for sure thought I was going to be an A&R guy. Like, I'm going to be an A&R guy, you know, like this, that's the best job ever. So where can I go? You know, I, I didn't want to move to a, a city without having a job or really understanding like what to do. So I applied to grad school and I applied to Miami in, uh, in Florida and NYU and I got into both and I, and I thought, well, where's the music at that I like? It's not in Miami. So I ended up going up to NYU for a graduate degree um, in music business. And so I spent two years at NYU. You know, it was a great experience. I met some really good people. You know, in retrospect, was it worth the money? No, I'm, you know, I'm still paying student loans. Oh, yeah. but, but I'm really glad that I did it. And I'm glad that I went to New York and I have that experience. And I met so many great people. And I got some really great internships, which kind of guided me into live music. Um, yeah, because so. I was going to say, we, so we, I think we met at a Polestar, maybe? Probably. Polestar yeah, yeah, probably. So, so I rem so I guess what I want to say, and I already told everyone that was on before you got on that you used to book BB Kings and, and Blue Note mm -hmm. and Highline. So um, how did you, once you graduated NYU, how did you get a booking job? Well, so while I was in NYU, I had internships and internships were the most valuable thing I really got out of grad school. Like it kind of opened the door to get you in places that you wouldn't be able to get if you just straight cold called. Right. So I had internship at like Interscope Records and A&R and Nothing Records, which is Nine Inch Nails label at A&R. And then I went to DreamWorks Records and worked for Michael Goldstone, you know, as an intern. At the same time, a buddy of mine in grad school got an internship at the Blue Note Jazz Club. And he said, you know, they just opened this club called BB Kings. The guy that's booking it, he's looking for an intern. Are you interested? I was like, yeah, that's cool. I love live music. You know, let me go check this out. So I went down and I met the guy that was booking BB Kings at the time. And he's, you know, he had just started too. And he's like, you sound great, man. You, you know, you're in grad school. You got your shit together. Sure. Come intern for me. And that's how it started. I interned for the guy that was booking BB Kings. And then you took and his I, spot when he left? Yeah, so I mean, here's the funny story. I interned for him for a year. Right before I was graduating from NYU, they hired me to be his assistant. I did a pretty good job, and the president of the company wanted to come down to the Blue Net where his office is and work for him for a year. And so after about two years, the guy that I had started interning for and became his assistant was just like phasing out he was i don't know what he was doing something you know drugs drinking too much he just burned out and he basically had to leave and so the president of the company who was my boss was like all right like you've been booking shows for me at our blue notes in vegas and here in new york and you're doing a good job he's like i think you can do this he's like go go take his job i'm going to give you six months to show me that you can do it and if you know, after six months we're doing okay the job is yours Wow. And so pretty much like I was in the right place at the right time. I had hustled. I'd worked hard. I had showed everyone there that like I was a competent individual and I held my own and he gave me a shot, you know, and you just don't know when you're going to get those opportunities. And so I took that opportunity and I ran with it, man. I just busted my ass and I, you know, tried to make as many contacts as I could and just reach out to people and just really learn the industry and as yeah. quickly as I could. And, and I did a really good job because I was there for, I don't know, eight, nine nine years or something like that so um well i remember um you know for those of you who don't aren't familiar with it bb kings in particular was w one of the few live music venues in manhattan 
um, because everyone thinks New York's just loaded with live music venues and it's sort of like LA, there's not a ton. And BB King's was like a mainstay. And was it 42nd Street? Or yeah, it was 42nd between 7th and 8th, right in Times right Square. Right in the middle of Times yeah. Square. So you had thousands of people walking by there every day. And you had, it was two showrooms, right? Or was it three? Yeah, I and mean, there was really one main showroom. And then there was a little restaurant next door where we did like local blues bands. So yeah. it's one one main space. But, you know, in New then, York at... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, New York at that time they didn't really have a room that was doing some of these like heritage acts. And I think that's why the owner of the company decided, you know, he's from the blue note. He was doing jazz all the time, did great. And he would bring in people like BB King to play the blue note, yeah. people like Etta James to play the blue note. Cause there was nowhere for these folks to play. And he's like, I should just open up Manhattan's house of blues. Cause there's no house of blues. And so that's why he did this deal with BB King. He opened up this room and they started just booking, you know, classic heritage acts. And it kind of branched out into other genres. And when I came in, I really started branching out into things like hip hop and oh, yeah. heavy metal and heavy metal and R and B and you know, all these other genres that really in Manhattan at the time were kind of like not being serviced. You know, you had the Bowery Ballroom and the hipster indie rock downtown, you had Irving Plaza and they were doing all the you know, the rock and the active rock, but no one was really looking at some of these niche genres at the time. And we really try to go after those and, and you know, make BB Kings a home for certain types of music that weren't, you know, it was, playing it was rooms. the spot though. Like it was so like all the hot 97, 97 yeah. stuff. And you had that one promoter guy. What was that promoter that would always do a big hip hop night there? What, Adam? And uh, uh, we had a few, man. I, I, there was like been. one guy you were like, I can't touch the night. This guy kills it every Sunday night or something. Yeah, like we that. had a few of those, man. They, some of those guys would just come every few years. It's just yeah. that one guy every few years that, you know, who I knows how he, we got those. I remember you, well, first and foremost, which was really cool because a lot of venues, you guys, for some of you guys that are like in bands and stuff, uh, venues, especially mainstay venues like bb kings or house of blues or key club or whatever they don't really love to do local nights um it's not if they don't if they have a choice to not do a local night they'd rather not do it um but you know clubs when they're operating need to to fill seven nights a week if they can so what i'm getting at is topher was cool enough to allow shp to do some local filler nights and once you allowed us to do that, we were able to tell our network, hey, we're booking BB Kings in Times Square and people went nuts. So we were able to do some filler nights or some early shows or late shows. I, I forget what it was, but we were able to do that. And that was because you were open minded about that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of value in the supporting local acts and upcoming acts and whether it's giving someone like you a whole night to do four or five acts or it's adding locals to national bands when you can and i know that's really hard to do a lot because national bands dictate who can open for them but when you can add a local i really for think sure. that adds a lot of value yeah. so yeah i, I mean, tried to do I, that obviously everyone knows our background but we've i've believed in that from day one so i've i've always believed if you can get more people in the venue and it comes through support acts so be it they make it's better for the bartender it's better for the show the crowd it's better for the valet guy. It's better for everybody. So mm -hmm. if you if you have the opportunity to put more people in the building via local acts or support acts, I've always been a big supporter of that. Yep. Totally. Um, so when you when you went from Blue Note, I remember. Now did you 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 went from Blue Note and then you started T Presents. Yeah. So I mean, the Blue Note, it was just Blue Note Jazz Club, and they had a few jazz clubs in Japan, and then. B.B. Kings came along and B.B. Kings started chugging along. We were doing really well. And so the owner wanted to keep expanding. And so we found a space downtown in Manhattan and he opened the Highline Ballroom, uh, which was one of my favorite clubs ever. I yeah. really love that I space. You took, me, you took me on a tour there once and I, we might have done one or two early. Yeah, so. right. So we opened that space and we just started crushing it from the beginning. I, I don't know why. It just had that vibe and people liked the neighborhood and yep. we booked the right acts. And, you know, we opened with like Lou Reed and yeah. we had a bunch of nights of uh, Mo and then there Amy Winehouse and most deaf played there. And then we had the Roots residency and like everyone yep. wanted to play that room. It was, yeah. it was the coolest spot. So 
we were chugging along booking that room. Um, we started booking uh, a club up outside of Massachusetts, or outside of Boston, sorry, called, called uh, Showcase Live, where the Patriots play right by the stadium. We started booking a club in Baltimore. And then towards the end of my kind of career with that company, we took over the Howard Theater in Washington, D.C., because it was renovated and we were booking that. And I was just churning, churning club shows, man, like seven, eight hundred club shows a year. And oh, I yeah. just got I got burned out. I mean, that's what happened, really. I just couldn't do it anymore. It's like I wasn't seeing my wife. I just had a kid. Like, yeah. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I was like, man, if I'm going to work this hard and I, I want to do it for myself, you know, yeah. like I don't want to do it for someone else anymore. So yeah. I put in my notice and, you know, I left and I opened my own company. So Right. And I remember when you first went on your own, you uh, – hit us up or we hit you up whatever but we ended up doing a club called stage 48 yeah which was in hell's kitchen right yeah yeah so when i formed my own company i was living in brooklyn and i'd open an office in brooklyn and i had a few you know local opportunities one of them was stage 48 which was a new like thousand cap club yeah. in hell's kitchen where i was booking shows um and so that's where we did a few hip-hop shows um yeah. So that was one of my first clubs I was booking. I had a nice little room in Manhattan called Subculture where I started booking like a lot of classical music because that's what the oh. owner wanted. So yeah. I got to get into that genre. I hadn't really hit that too much. So it was like singer songwriters, classical. And but my, you know, my goal always was to leave New York. And so about a year, year and a half after I started my company, I moved back to Wisconsin. Um, and I just been working out of, you know, my residences in Wisconsin ever since, you know, I, I learned you don't, and you then know, you no one knows where you are work. anyway, man. Right. So. No, I mean, booking, you could be anywhere, but then right. you, 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 you went to live nation for about a year or so. Yeah. Well, back here in Madison, uh, live nation had a theater downtown and they were up against some kind of stiffer local independent competition. And I had been to Madison for several years and I, I wasn't looking to work for anybody, but they reached out to me and they're like, Hey, we need someone to book this theater. And it was a theater that I grew up going to, you know, it's a beautiful, like 2000 plus capacity theater. And I was like, all right, I, you know, I'd consider it. And so I talked to the guys there and they let me keep my company. Right. Yeah. They let me book some shows as my own company had, on the side. Yeah. Thing, there was certain language right. I remember when we were doing stuff that you were talking Yeah. About. So it was like a deal that I couldn't say no to. Like I get to keep my company. I get to book a lot of the shows I was already doing and I get to book this beautiful theater I grew up going to. So I did that for a year and about a year into it, they bought that local competitor yeah. that they wanted to compete with. And then like it was you know, it was just kind of over. They just yeah. kind of gave everything up to those guys here in town. And so I went back to, to doing my own thing a hundred percent. So at, so T presents, um, you know, let, let everyone know sort of like COVID aside, what did like 2019 look like for you? I think it was going to be my best year ever. Pretty certain, pretty certain it would be my best year ever. Um, just the shows I had on sale and confirmed were all doing great and the, the show count was high and I didn't have any big stinkers on my calendar like I've had in the past. You know, like you have a few where you're like, shit, like this is going to ruin yeah. my month. I didn't have any of that. So <laughs> I really think it was going to be my best year ever. 2019 I, or 20? Oh, no, uh, I think 20, sorry. This 2020. Year. Yeah, this year. My bad. Yeah. So. So, okay, um, but but – Let's forget this year, as yep. most people would say. <laughs> sure. And I, I'm all for it. And, you know, gosh, I mean, I think only psychologically we're going to feel better on New Year's Day, but this shit's still going to linger for a minute. So yep. it just is what it is. So in 2019, yeah, how many shows did you do and what were the primary venues that you booked? So I operate my company a lot differently than most promoters. I go everywhere. You know, I go all over the country. It doesn't matter what market it is. My model is kind of find a band or an agent or a manager that I have a good relationship with, grab onto an act, and try to do them wherever I can. And so while I might have a lot of shows, like I think 19, I did 120 shows or something. You know, I had three acts that I did probably 15 shows each on their tour, you know, because that's my model. So I like to go find some of these niche artists that, you know, the big guys aren't looking for or yeah. don't care about, yeah. right? That I know and understand their fans or their market, and I can find those people everywhere and just make those tours work. So, 
So it's like people like John Waters, you know, yeah, do which most is of his... super cool. I mean, it's like we we've done John Waters with you for I don't know, seven years, something like that. Seven yeah. since 2013, maybe whenever you yeah. started it, right. we did the Wilshire Ebo. Um, but that's a unique take on your company. So sometimes you buy the whole tour, right? I mean, I'll try to buy as many as I can. I don't know that I get the whole tour, but people like John, I get, you know, 99% of the shows, you know? So I'll buy the whole tour if I can. Yeah. We, we try to do that too. Um, with, with what SHP does with regards to tours, you guys, and with agents and stuff like that, is you have to send offers um, for different markets. And the agents sift through the offers, and they're like, okay, uh, Topher gets the Madison, Wisconsin show. Sean gets Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Jeffrey gets Los Angeles at Nokia. So that's sort of how it works. So an agent will put a tour out there, and then all the buyers send in their offers for their cities and the agents will go over with the managers and they'll come back and say who gets what. Um, unless it's something like Live Nation buys the whole tour for a couple million dollars or AEG buys the whole tour or Topher buys the whole tour. You know, so that's typically how that part of our business works for those of you guys who, who, don't, who don't know that. Um, and we did... And when you say niche, it's super cool because John Waters is, is like awesome. And I think our show would have been last Monday, right? If I'm not mistaken. Probably. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and all the old ones keep popping up on my Facebook. And it's just like, you know, I, 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 I look at my Facebook memories and I see that, you know, the first one we did at Willis or Ebo had Johnny Depp there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then like some of the – um. The, the, the comedy store ones had like the Osbournes and stuff, you know, so it was just super, super cool. And we do have a date in the books for 2021, December. So hopefully it plays, you know, and, uh, and then we did Paul Mooney at the comedy store. Yep. Yep. Which, that which was... was interesting. Man. Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> I did that. Uh, I'd say a good handful of dates with him at the end there, and you just didn't know what you're gonna get, man. Oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot. Were you at, were you there at that one? No, I didn't. I didn't come to that one. No, it wasn't. It wasn't spectacular. Um, no, but I think people were just so happy to see him on stage, right. and he sat through the whole thing. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, he probably doesn't remember it, but it, it, but it was for the comedy store history and Paul Mooney and Richard Pratt yeah. and all that. It sort of brought it all back. No, totally, Ben. Yeah, I mean, especially I, if you guys watch those comedy store documentaries, Paul Mooney and Richard Pryor comedy store. So, you know, that's been something that we have, we've developed a really cool relationship with you at is the comedy store. Right. Um, and we're, we're like, both of us are like concert promoters, but we've, we've been doing the comedy. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Don't know what happened, but we're back. I mean, it's probably our internet. I don't know. Okay. Like, where I live, it's like the mountains and fucking yeah. horrible internet and just stupid shit and i have like dsl or i don't know what i have i don't have <laughs> i don't have whatever the wireless phone whatever that is broadband i don't have that i have like yeah why i have high i have high speed internet so anyway here we go because people can watch this again so this will be part sure. two so Sounds i good. want to get into the questions um, okay and 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 there's 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 different ones um how do I book shows before I've had a real online presence and fan base? And should I? <laughs> That's a really good question. I mean, I think once you start playing and you, you want to be taken seriously, you obviously have to open up your social media pages and, you know, have a website and try to get at least your friends and family to like you and then go out. And I, I always believe you just got to play shows. You know, just go play shows anywhere. You can play a show, play a show. If it's a coffee house, if it's somebody's basement, you know, wherever it is out on the corner, even sometimes just go play a show and, and kind of, you know, hone your craft. And once you are good at playing shows, people will come and they'll want to see you and then they'll want to pay to see you, you know? Yeah. So I, you mentioned coffee houses and I've always been a huge proponent of that. Um, you know, when things were normal, especially with local bands or even touring bands, you have to be careful about how many times you play a market. Sure. You know what I mean? And especially like LA in its heyday, probably New York too, as a local band, 
you don't want to play like every month in New York or every month in LA, unless you have a following. If you don't have a following and you're just bringing your girlfriends and your drunk right. uncle, right. don't, don't play in the big city like that. Right, play, right. play the coffee houses, the coffee houses. They're not expecting to be packed. You right. know what I mean? So any business they get when you're playing is bonus business. Totally. Um, yep. and, and play those coffee houses on the outskirts of town too. Right. Um, do that stuff. But when you guys are trying to play main cities, don't overdo it and only do it if you have a draw. Don't expect the other bands to have all the people and all that. So, right. um, so yeah, coffee houses I'm big on. That's a great way to build your following, especially yep. these days with email and social media. Yep. And, and I also believe in music scenes, you know, and they're different in different cities and smaller cities is probably easier than in LA or New York, but like get into a scene, like meet other bands, meet other people, become friends with them, yeah. you know, jam, jam with them on the weekends, rehearse with them, you know, join well, a that, book group, you know, whatever, man, just meet other musicians and then that will lead to things. So. That completely answers question number two, which was I can sell out a show in my own home city, but I'm struggling to break into new cities how do I expand my audience? Right. I mean, that's it. Just reach out to other bands. Even if they're in a different territory or a different city and you like them, be like, hey, man, I really like your music. I live in Wichita and I can sell out a show. Come open for me. And can I come open for you wherever you live? You know, like, I think that's a great way to expand your fan base as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's like they call it like tagging on, tagging on with bands. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. How. How do promoters decide what to pay an artist? I wish there was an exact science to this. Um, you know, there isn't. There's so many different factors that go into it. I mean, you can look at their past history. Where did they play last time? You know, how many tickets did it sell? What was the ticket price? Then you could also go and look at their social media metrics. Like, oh, they have, you know, a bazillion streams and so many YouTube, you know, views and, you can even kind of go regionally and see, you know, what the metrics are in certain areas of the country, and that can help you. Um, you know, you can ask your friends who are promoters in other parts of the country who might have done them. Hey, what did you sell on this band in your town? You know, like, how did it do? And then you just make an educated guess, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. there's no science I mean, to it, really. It's, it's true. It's, it's gambling. You know, it's, yeah. it's gambling our business. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, our business is based on mathematics. Um it's based on the capacity of the building, how many tickets can be sold in the building, how much it costs to rent the building, and what the cover charge is. And that's essentially how you come up with an offer. Now, you have to determine what that offer is, but those are the, the, the mathematics. Those are the, the um, I don't know what the word is, but those are the sectors that determine, I'm gonna pay you five grand, the place holds 500 people, it's twenty dollars to get in. There's a ten thousand dollar gross. I'm paying you five grand. I know the venue's charging me thirty five hundred. I know I'm gonna spend a thousand on marketing, and there's a thousand dollars promoter profit. So that's kind of how our world works as promoters and and mathematics and determining what your value is. Now, yeah, obviously, if it's somebody you know is a surefire sellout, you you send them a sellout offer, and that is the capacity times the cover charge in full that's the amount you're giving to the artist um come on jack there's jack okay so uh are live streams lucrative for artists and promoters uh for me personally live streams not particularly lucrative but have, have you know, you i haven't uh, I I have not done them myself. I've participated in marketing a live stream. So I haven't had a live stream from a venue that I book just because there's not a whole lot of bands living in, in Madison that have, you know, huge reaches. Um, but I have, like, participated in helping to market, you know, a band live streaming from another location, you know, where you get X dollars per every ticket sold. And it just, I mean, for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. Right to make 50 bucks here or a hundred bucks there or something, you know, it's just, for me, it doesn't make sense for other promoters. I've, I've heard, you know, that have much larger databases or like centralized to one town where it's like, they're the guy in that town or the person or the company in that town, they've made good money because they have a huge database and they can really push certain artists to those folks. But for me, because the way I operate is spread out, 
and I'm not lo- really localized. I kind of do stuff all over the country. It hasn't really made a lot of sense yeah. for me. So, I mean, that's, that's good. Cause it's like a, it's the difference, I guess, between, um, between our companies. So we, and we, t- I talked about this before I brought you on, we are doing the live streams and it's full on ticketed and you go to ticket web or Ticketmaster and you buy a 10 or $12 ticket. And if you want, you can buy a t-shirt to, you know, as a VIP, we're doing VIP meet and greets with some of these bands. So for us, um, we are doing them. And what I alluded to earlier before we brought you in is that, you know, for a lot of the bands, uh, local and national touring acts, they haven't played in a year. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So it's like, okay, you, you A, want to get your chops back. Maybe you never lost them. But you want to get them back. And B, you got a fan base that hasn't seen you that at this point right now, people are starving for content. So people will buy a ticket to watch you on their iPad or their phone perform or, or Instagram Live for free. So um, for us, we've been doing it. It's not very lucrative, um, but it's a path. Uh, it's a path for us to continue to keep working. And it's a path for the artists to continue to perform and to, you know, show their visibility. Yeah, totally. And I, I totally understand it. And it works, I think, well in certain markets, you know, your yeah. market. And I've talked to other promoters that have done great with it. And it is a way to keep people working, whether it's local acts or venues or promoters or tech people. But for me personally, with my situation, it just doesn't, doesn't make so sense. So how, me. so let yeah. me ask you this. So what, if, what are you able to work on with everything closed? Um, haven't done a lot since March. Um, so I do, I book shows, uh, for a company in Illinois called Jay Goldberg Entertainment. Um, and we did two really big drive-in shows with Billy Strings over the end of the summer. So, you know, that took a lot of work, just finding places where we could pack in five, 600 cars, figuring out how to ticket these things, you know, production wise. So that was fun. And, you know, we did that and, Spent a lot of time trying to get other shows to happen too in the drive-in format. Uh, wasn't able to make too many happen, but I think for this coming spring we're gonna we're gonna lock down some. I booked a show for the University of Illinois, like a, a student show at the stadium, like their big fall show um, with Hobo Johnson. So I got to work on that. That you know that was fun. That was my first show that I'd booked in a long time. Um, and then now I'm doing some shows with uh, Parnes down in Florida at a pod kind of socially distant pod setup in Delray beach. So we just did G love last month and we have a, a couple of shows coming up early next year and hopefully confirm a few more after the break. So, you know, I haven't been particularly busy. Uh, most of the work I've been doing is just moving shows that were already confirmed multiple yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Know? Which, which so. we were going to say, so, you know, for those of you guys that are, uh, don't get our world, um, when D-Day happened on March 12th, 13th, all these tours came down. Some of these tours have been booked for six months, eight months, um, and they had to be rescheduled, and nobody knew how long the pandemic was going to last. So shows that were scheduled for April or May moved to October, and then they were gone. You know what I mean? So some of these tours and these shows have been moved two or three times, and I guess this leads me to my next question. So what's a safe bet for now? Like when will you start taking dates? You know, when, I mean, I don't know that there's a way to classify anything as safe at this point, but I'm feeling okay with smaller shows at the very end of the summer. And then like the summer. Yeah. You know, I'm talking small club shows, 50 people, a hundred people like that. Like I have a small room that I'm a partner in in Madison here. We're 130 cap. And so like, I'm looking at end of summer as feeling okay about having a show play. It may not play at hundred percent capacity. It may play at 50% capacity, but I think it will play not positive, but I think on the larger shows though, I'm hoping in the fall. You know, like, wow. that's my hope. <laughs> you know, we just so don't know, do you, man. Do you think that, I mean, it changes every day. So people, you know, I read something on CNN today that said that they hope that to have 80% of the country vaccinated by May. Okay. So let's assume, let's say, okay, everyone's vaccinated and it's May, Memorial Day. Are the venues going to open at full capacity or will they be reduced capacity? 
I mean, I, I wish I could even answer that. I don't know. And I think every state's going to be different, right? Like Wisconsin, where I am, has just been like a free for all, except for the town where I live, Madison and Milwaukee, like the rest of the state, you just do whatever you want. It's kind of like Florida, right? You can basically do whatever you want. You go and you hit Illinois, can't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's just one state south. So I think it's really going to depend on the state and who's running that state. Is it a red state or a blue state? And if it's a blue state, you know, which I am totally in agreement with, it's going to take a lot longer to get stuff done. Are there, so, are there shows happening in Milwaukee? No. Uh -uh. So like where in Wisconsin could you go tonight and see a band? <sighs> right now? I mean, I don't even know, man. You might be able to see a bar band play, like, in a small town up north, but not in a, not a real show. Are restaurants know? open there for indoor dining? Uh, they are open at a very limited capacity in the two major cities. Outside of that, I mean, you can – I think you can still do whatever you want. So, yeah. like, if you want to go jam into a restaurant up in Green Bay, you can do it. I'm not saying people are doing it. They're not yeah. packed. I think they're pretty empty. But you could do it if you want. Yeah. Um, earlier in the summer, stuff was packed. You know? Yeah, no, like, here too. In LA, all these restaurants were like, yeah. up until a month ago, were packed. Yeah, and yeah exactly. It's, it's, and I don't care what, you know, I don't want to get political on it, but people are like, well, there's no data that the restaurants are the reason why. <laughs> well, wherever the fuck you have people and right. drinks and bathrooms and yeah. tables and bars and football games on, you're going to have interaction. You just are. So, right. yeah. you know, um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, it varies every day. Uh, I have no idea. L.A. is in such a bad place right now, and it's so sad um, how bad it is here. Uh, and if you, you know, the next time you come here, I mean, you'll see it's just L.A. is just, you know, we won two championships this year, but the city's just decimated. And it, you can see it when you're driving down Sunset and, and you know, places are boarded up and it's, right. it's really awful. Yeah. Um so what about festivals? I mean, this is, I was thinking about festivals before this call because a few things have been kind of blowing my mind, like Rolling Loud in the spring and like Ultra in the spring. Like, how do they even think that that's going to happen? How about, <laughs> you know? how about, how, how about uh, uh, we have um, Bottle Rock is in May now. After uh, I, I, so, yeah. yeah, so Bottle no Rock way. was last May, then it moved to October, now it's May. Right. But you yeah. don't, so you don't see a large festival happening in May? No, uh, no way. I can't and, see how that that's going to, especially about, in California. What about Lollapalooza in August? In August? I mean, maybe. I, I give it a maybe, you know? I mean, maybe by then if, if there's enough vaccination around and, you know, like, I just don't know. I think August is tough, but I give it a maybe. But spring, I say no way. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't I imagine it. What about... Um, what about June Governor's Ball in New York? In June? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are all gigs that Coda's booked on. That's why I'm asking. Oh, really? Okay. I'm going to say these probably. These are all festivals that are moved already. So <laughs> Right. I'm... Probably not, man. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah, September, mean, you know? Yeah. I, I, I want to hold out hope that, like, March or April – some of the stuff's going to start opening back up, even at a capacity or you have to wear masks or whatever. I'm hoping for that. Yeah. Obviously, January, February, and probably March are shot. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, hoping April. But, I mean, who knows? Yeah, and, you know, and I think someone just threw in the chat, too, about, like, opening international borders. Like, can, yeah. who knows when the Canadian border is going to open, you know, like, he said Australia in August, September. Yeah, Australia, uh, August. I mean, and they're it's... but in Australia, they're doing full on festivals. Like, right? I mean, you have to quarantine if you go there sure. for two weeks. But they're they're operating as normal there. Well, that makes sense. They don't have three thousand people dying a day. You yeah. know, like <laughs> they did it the right way. We didn't, and we're yeah. suffering big time because of it. So yeah, exactly, and we're the laughing stock of the world. We really totally. Are. It's totally. really bad. Um, yep. Uh, are so. I know it's tough to tell, but do you see certain markets opening first? Well, I mean, Florida's open, right? I mean, yeah. people are doing club shows in Florida. I mean, when Parnes and I decided to do some of these pod shows, I was like, look, I'll do the pod show, but there's no way in hell I'm putting my name on, like, a club show. You know, like, I, I just won't. It, 
you know, I won't have that on my conscience, you know, yeah. that like I brought people into a club to see a show close together and they don't even have to wear a mask. Like that just doesn't work for me. Yeah. But there are places where they're doing shows. I think Oklahoma, they're doing shows. Texas has shows. Florida Dallas, has shows. Houston, Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're doing full on club shows, no mask. You can wear right. it if you want. Like, right. Especially hip hop. They're like packed in there and it's like, yeah. holy shit, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I, just... I mean, we all need to make a couple bucks right now, but I can't, I wouldn't, it's not worth it to me, you know? just to have that on my conscience is someone got sick and somebody died or, you know, it's just like, you really want to be a part of that. I don't. So. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's all, it's all going to be very interesting the next 90 days, 90 to a hundred days. I think we can really all hope for the best. Um, are you, are agents hitting you up for avails or are you I actually started out? the last like week or two? I started seeing some real avails come down the pipe. Um, like, you know, not just for like Florida where they know they can book a show, but you know, for the Midwest, um, I haven't confirmed anything, you know, yeah. a couple offers out, but I'm like seeing some movement and people are feeling better about how next year is going to be. You know, some people are a little bit more bullish than others, you know, in terms of the dates they want to hold. Um, but I'm seeing a lot more for the fall, you know, fall of next year. And let me, let me ask you, and we'll wrap up. Um, so how are you, I guess what I want to know is how are you c coming up with offers knowing that the venues may be reduced capacity or the shows may or may not happen? Um, you just put language in your offer that protects you, you know, that if, you know, the venue is not open because of COVID restrictions, you know, you're not obligated to send a deposit or pay a bit, play, pay the balance or actually play the show. Um, you know, that's one of the things we're doing. Um, it's basically just try to protect yourself in the language and hope that your relationship with that agent carries through, right? Like right now, I probably wouldn't make a really high offer to an agent I have not worked with in the past or really trust yeah. because it's all about the relationship with the, the person you're working sure. with. So and, yeah, I think people are a little more understanding, you know, our business can be really ruthless and uh, you know, it can be a dictatorship at times when agents are like, you have to do this. We're not giving you a break. This is right. how much you're paying us or we're not coming, you know? Right. And I think everyone's had to soften up obviously because there is a chance that these shows don't happen. I know, Live Nation sent something out saying that they were doing 25% reductions, I believe, on yep, every yep. offer, right? Like, no matter what. Like, that's yep. just part of the deal. Yep. Um, so, whereas they had an offer to give you $10,000 uh, this year, next year that offer will be 7500 And they won't send a deposit until, like, a few days before. And right, be 10%. Yep. Yeah, you know, I heard of that. I did see that. I, I did hear from another promoter colleague in another market that they had confirmed a show with a major agency and they received a contract for that show. And I think it was one of these socially distant kind of pod shows. And on that uh, contract rider, there was a new clause that says if the artist is ready and willing to perform and the show cannot play because of COVID restrictions, the promoter still owes that artist 100%. And like we were just like what? <laughs> That's yeah, crazy, yeah, man. Yeah, no, for sure. No. Yeah, you big know. X through that. But but that's happening with a major agency. Yeah. So I, I believe that it's going to um, take another year before things get back to routing normally. You sure. know what I mean? Um, the, you know, I will be able to see guys like us in our, in especially because we're in Los Angeles when. When these venues get a green light to open, um, we're going to be their first call, you know, my company, hopefully, um, mm -hmm. because we can fill anything, you know, in a week. You know what right. I mean? So, and Pete, there's going to be a demand for it. So I think the question now is just hanging in there until then, trying to be creative. You know, we, we're doing, like I said, the live streams and we're doing marketing and some PR and, and, and the merchandise, obviously. So, you know, we're, we're trying to stay busy and active. Um, but yeah, I mean, even though there is light at the end of the tunnel, our business is still very uncertain for if, when, where, and how. Right. 
Well, and one thing I've, I've been telling people throughout this whole kind of eight month process here is whoever makes it to the other side here is going to be in a much stronger position as an independent, not, not talking about the big guys, but like any independent that gets through this and can still do shows on the other side, Dude, like, you know, you're going to get more shows than you did before. That's why we're doing this podcast. That's why I'm wearing this hat. That's why we're doing the Troubadour Sunday with a camera crew. You know, it's, it's staying in the mix, staying active, staying creative, stay branding and stay giving opportunity however you can. And, and that's all we can do because the concert business has truly been forgotten. And I do believe fan wise, people are really starting at Jones right now. Like mm -hmm. now it's been, okay, I need to be at a freaking concert in the front right. row banging my head because I'm going through withdrawals. And, you know, I think that that's really, um, part of the deal and and people are going through live music withdrawals they really are you mm -hmm. know i mean Definitely. i'm starting to go through it you know like i mean i didn't go to as many shows as much as i used to but i still checked in you know once a month somewhere and and i miss the action you know i really do i miss mm -hmm. i miss seeing the artists come out on stage and everyone goes crazy you know it's just, right. it's really something so I guess we all just got to hang in there and uh, be safe. And, you know, there is hope at least, you know, two months ago, there was no hope. Right. You know? Exactly. So at least, at least there's a path. Um, and it's going to be a tough path, but it's a path and it's a way to get back to live music and touring and booking shows. And I hope that we can do that with you as we have done and we continue the relationship. For sure, man. We'll, we'll get more down the road. Definitely. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for, for joining Topher and have a safe holiday to you and your family. And, yep, you too. Uh, and we'll see you soon and we'll send you a link to this. And uh, I appreciate it. All right. Have a good holiday. Thanks, Topher. See ya. Bye bye. All right, guys. Well, that was Topher uh, Christensen. And hopefully he um, gave you guys some good knowledge. I mean, he certainly gave me good knowledge because. You know, he's in the Midwest and handling the East Coast, and we're in Los Angeles, and who knows, and it's different and all that. So, you know, stay active, stay busy. If you're an unsigned artist, keep making music. Again, consider the live stream, because you just heard Topher say he doesn't think it's coming back till the end of summer. So everyone will tell you something different, but nobody knows. So if you're an artist, keep performing, keep being creative, keep doing live streams whatever you can do to stay active. If you're a promoter, stay active, be creative, do podcasts, do, do concerts, do live streams, do merchandise. Um, that's really it for tonight, you guys. I want to remind you, the newsletter, link in the bio. If you enjoyed this, give us your email. We'll let you know about the next ones. If you want to support us, we have merch on sale, shpmarket.com. Proceeds go to help us pay for everyone's health insurance. For our furloughed guys and, and us here so it's for a good cause um january 29th ty cannon from aftermath dr dre's right hand a and r guy um responsible for anderson pock and many others he'll be our guest and we're going to be talking about labels um february 26th atron gregory formerly tupac and digital underground's manager we're going to talk about tupac a lot um and digital underground and my friend shock g so that's it for today, shpmarket.com for the merch, the goods and services, and the link in the bio, email link in the bio. You can catch all these past episodes, link and bio. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, stay safe, you guys, and we'll see you January 29th. Peace out.